Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending upon where you're joining us today. Hello and welcome to this Association of Corporate Treasuries webinar, where today we'll be hearing from one of the world's leading professional services businesses on how business and treasuries can continue to deal with the effects of COVID-19. Treasuries have played a key role in helping the businesses deal with the effects of the coronavirus in areas such as cash flow forecasting, managing existing or new borrowing facilities, applying to government intervention programs, and concentrating and investing surplus liquidity. Here at the ACT, we've been reaching out to treasurers both in the UK and overseas to understand the sort of issues they're facing and to ensure their voices are heard when we talk with HM Treasury, the Bank of England and the FCA, as well as organisations such as the CBI and the City of London. We continue to run a weekly liquidity survey and the results can be found in the COVID-19 part of the ACT Knowledge Hub, along with other resources produced by the ACT and links to resources from other organisations. If you've 30 seconds, please complete the survey, even if you've done so before. It really helps us understand how sentiment across the Treasury community is changing and is a key topic of interest when we talk with the Bank of England, the Treasury and the FCA. We also ran a highly successful International Treasury Week last month with over 3,400 registrants from 80 countries and a guest appearance from Mark Carney, the ex governor of the Bank of England. Our next event in July will be the Festival of Treasury Transformation, and we'll look at how the pandemic is accelerating the pace of transformational change across Treasury departments through areas like technology, people, and working attitudes. Now, as economists and businesses move out from the initial crisis, most organizations are looking beyond liquidity for the next four weeks and are broader factors that will affect their businesses. Today, joining us to talk about credit facilities, working capital, pensions, and insolvency, we have four lawyers from Herbert Smith Freehills. I'm told that's an argument of lawyers. Um, before we get going, a bit of housekeeping. So what you'll see at the bottom of your screen um, is a button that allows you to submit questions. And we'd like this session to be as interactive as possible, so please don't wait until the end but submit questions as we go through, and we'll endeavour to cover off as many as we can. If you do ask a question, we won't mention your name or your company, so do feel free to ask everything, anything and everything. Now, before we get going, um, some introductions. I'm Naresh Agarwal, and after 30 years working in Treasury, I now provide policy and technical support here at the ACT. And joining us today, we have Gabrielle Wong, Kristen Roberts, Rachel Pinto, and Kevin Pullen. Gabrielle has over 20 years experience advising clients on a wide spectrum of financing instruments. Kristen leads the corporate debt and acquisition finance team in London and works closely with treasury teams across treasury matters and products. Rachel is a pensions expert providing advice on scheme funding and changes to benefit design as well as advising on the impact of corporate activity on pension schemes. And last but by no means least, Kevin has over 20 years experience working on all forms of debt reconstruction, including schemes, arrangements and CBAs, and insolvency acting for debtors, creditors and insolvency practitioners. And Kevin introduced me to a new phrase, ipso facto. Um, so as we get going, I'll now hand over to, um, to Kristen. Yes, thank you, Naresh. Um, I'm going to touch on uh, obviously the items that uh, will come up on the next slide. But just to kick off with a couple of observations on the government funding schemes. Now, clearly, the role and scope of those schemes is well documented and well understood. And so I just want to provide a couple of observations on how they're functioning and some issues to consider. Uh, and the first of those is that <clears throat> at the end of May, the government introduced restrictions on dividends, uh, distributions, and uh, certainly cash pay, pay, pay caps and bonuses uh, for those accessing longer dated CCF loans and uh, CLB ILS loans over 50 million. Now, this is not going to be a determining factor as to whether uh, you know, corporate needs that liquidity and accesses these facilities, but a well-advised treasurer will, of course, ensure that every board member knows that that is the case before they commence those discussions and so I wanted to flag that first off. Um, moving on to the CLB ILS, one of the sticking points there is that the company um, cannot have been an undertaking in difficulty at the end of the, uh, the last calendar year in order to access that facility uh, and that's driven by state aid rules but the onus for finalising that assessment falls to the banks 
uh, and, and that's not typically part of their normal credit process. And, and that is driving, uh, obviously, some uncertainty, some delays, and, and I think, candidly, you know, some nervousness, uh, because if that factor is not met, then the government guarantee might not be available. So you can see banks grappling with that issue. Similarly, for the CLB, ILS, that debt cannot be subordinated to um, other borrower debt. And so you can see in that situation that there may need to be intercreditor discussions with existing lenders to ensure that it has the right ranking and priority. Um, use of the CCF, I mean, we have, I think, the latest number is about 165 approved with 55 drawn. So many seeing this as a contingency line. Uh, some have used it for liquidity needs. I think some have used it uh, so that they can repay more expensive debt. Um, with the CCFF, there have been delays in the process for atypical borrowers, so not PLCs or LLPs, for example, uh, and those who are not rated by credit rating agencies. Uh, moving on to new financings generally and, and some of the issues we see in the, the corporate debt markets. Uh, and the first is the, the balance of refinancings and one-year extensions. And, and many refinancing processes now have been put in the top drawer in favour of a, a one-year extension with the idea of getting out that uh, amend and extend or, or refinancing probably Q4, Q1 next year. And I'll, I'll come on to talk about some of the consequences of, of that potentially shortly. Uh, in terms of bank credit processes, we see them significantly longer than pre-COVID. So if anyone thinking of an amend and extend or, or refinancing, you know, a period of one month for credit approvals is not unusual uh, and sometimes more. Uh, given the... Uh, the people are looking for new sources of liquidity, it's very challenging for corporates by and large to introduce new lenders either to their syndicates or for bilateral lending. And so certainly what we've seen are corporates exercising accordion features or putting in place incremental liquidity lines very much with their existing syndicates. And so that does beg the question, are banks supportive? And I'd say that the bank loan markets remain active, busy, and banks are broadly supportive. Clearly, uh, that depends on sector and business, but there's increasing nervousness. And so whilst not all banks might participate in incremental lending, they will nonetheless typically consent to it being incurred by that borrower. In terms of bank commercial lending terms, the cost of capital and credit concerns have certainly driven much higher pricing during COVID and more conservative lending behaviours. And we're seeing that manifesting itself through things like shorter tethers, greater controls over borrower businesses and, and seeking to ensure that, particularly in the non-investment grade space, that cash does not leave the business, so in the form of dividend blocks. Similarly, um, sorry to interrupt you, Kristen, but does that also um, affect different sectors as well? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly some sectors are, are obviously in greater difficulty than others. But uh, whilst you have that sectoral overlay, clearly there are a number of different corporates within each sector, some of whom are much better capitalised than, than some others. And so you'll have seen uh, in the market those who have been able to uh, in increase their liquidity facilities, they've been able to tap the CCFS, they've affected placings. Uh, and so um, I, I wouldn't apply just a, a brush across the whole sector. I, I think you, you'd have to pick and choose the corporates within that sector. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's fine. But, but, uh, and to that point, I think, so what we're seeing uh, also, and it relates to that point, is that those who have enjoyed, you know, a debt capital structure, which was RCF only, particularly those weaker companies are now seeing pressure to in introduce term loans with amortising repayment schedules and a lot more focus on receivables financing and indeed sale and leasebacks uh, there. Um, over the longer term, and this is the point I, I mentioned earlier, the leveraging of balance sheets, whether it's through government debt or otherwise, and the deferral of refinancings, I think, will mean that the end of this year and into 2021 is very busy. Uh, so pushing out those refinancings, they will have to be refinanced at some point. And you can see the position we are in now in terms of pressure on borrowers in terms of pricing and terms, long credit processes uh, and some uncertainty can be carried forward in the debt markets into uh, next year. And, and, you know, as with the financial crisis, lenders will naturally be uh, more selective than um, uh, they might have been in the past. The one upside, I think we will see a significant focus on ESG uh, return in, in the debt markets. It's been a prevailing seed team uh, and a, a rallying call coming out of the pandemic. So I think we will see um, much more of that.
And the rest, there are no questions on the, the new side. I'm just going to turn briefly to existing financing, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so, thank you. Uh, so, but the first thing I wanted to just touch on there were COVID waivers. Uh, so, for that, typically financial covenant waivers, but where anyone's waiving financial covenants, they're also picking up and excluding COVID from, from MAE clauses. Um, and the first point I wanted to make there was that for these waivers, there's no real one size that fits all. So we've seen either a complete suspension of covenants and agreements to add back pre-COVID EBITDA or increasing maximum leverage uh, or agreeing the suspension, but including other covenants. So, for example, minimum liquidity or maximum negative EBITDA, i.e. a cap on, on, on losses. Uh, and um, it's fair to say that these can be iterative process with banks. Banks still want the actual covenant ratios, particularly for margin ratchet purposes, even if they're waiving the covenants. And the covenants can uh, be in place up to 18 months. I think 12 months is typically more common um, but than 18 we've seen on the outside. Uh, and I'm afraid so on school that consent fees have now become typical for these uh, types of waivers. Uh, alongside potentially in the non-investment grade space, increased financial reporting, restriction on certain optional business activity like acquisitions, distributions, and so forth. Uh, the final piece I just wanted to pick up on was around um, managing existing financing. Clearly, as the bedrock of your existing facilities, they need to be managed. And uh, the three things we have really been focusing on with our corporate clients there have been periodically reassessing uh, the potential draw stops and events of default, MAE, suspension, cessation of business, as I've talked about, financial covenants and so forth. But, but also this pandemic is unusual. It's not just an economic recession. It's producing different pressures on businesses, and that's necessitating you know, different types of, of consents and waivers, whether it's cessation of business, whether your auditors cannot actually complete their audits, so you can't deliver audited financial statements and so forth. And so it's important that uh, treasurers proactively manage their facility and look out for issues. I appreciate it might not be uh, the number one like job, but certainly it's an important thing to do in the current environment. Allied with that, there are two other focus points. One is assessing weak links in the capital structure, so really honing in on local facilities, bilaterals, which may not have been um, significantly negotiated and therefore may contain hair triggers, and ensuring that they are complied with to avoid cross-contaminating the bigger financing through the cross-default clauses. Uh, and finally, just on existing financing, certainly balancing um, committed versus uncommitted lines and corporates ensuring that they have sufficient committed liquidity, that they have some cover to the extent that uh, uncommitted LC facilities must be cash covered, uncommitted receivable financings and overdrafts withdrawn, or merchant acquirers yeah, were to increase retention rates, for example. Uh, and the rest of what I was proposing to talk about on, on that topic. Okay, I've got one, one, one question which is I find quite confusing as well. It's about the ranking or subordination of government aided loans. Um, another Latin word, pari passu. Um, could you yeah. give us some thoughts around that? Yeah, yeah sure. It's, um, I, I think the Latin throws many, if I'm honest with you. So, so pari passu just means that they rank equally between themselves. Um, so it's looking at the payment obligations themselves. So is the obligation which X owes Y the same ranking as the obligation which X owes Z? And typically under English law, yes, that's always the case. They, they rank equally unless you've subordinated one to the other. However, the, the commercial overlay to that is often the giving of guarantees and security. So if another entity gives a guarantee, whilst the original payment obligation may be paid to sue, the guarantee gives an alternative source of recourse to that creditor. Uh, and similarly, security gives uh, a proprietary interest or a transfer of rights to discharge a debt. And so whilst they may rank equally, so they're both payable in the insolvency, a secured creditor will have a different source of recourse in terms of enforcing that asset. And where, where does the um, government um, government schemes fall into this? Are they to the rank above everyone else? Uh, well, we, Kevin will come on to talk a bit about this later in terms of the change to the insolvency law and how that will impact on ranking. But the intention for the CCFS is certainly that it's a senior uh, unsecured obligation of, and it's typically the holding company in the group which will issue the CP. Whereas with the CIB ILS, 
the intention that they would rank uh, seniors uh, alongside any other secured debt. And so there'll be discussions potentially there as to how that process or how that debt does truly sit alongside and share in those arrangements. OK, thank you very much. Um, we've got time at the end for some more questions. Um, but um, actually, just one before we move on. If you don't use the CCFS, do you think, is there a risk the Bank of England will effectively cancel it if you've not actually drawn on it? Yeah, so the CCFS obviously is not a committed source of funding in the conventional sense. It's, it's an option to issue paper, which the Bank of England may or may not purchase. Uh, and so in the legal sense, it's uncommitted. Politically, you'd like to think that there, that it'll be around uh, to see us through the pandemic. Um, but clearly there are very significant political pressures in terms of the overall cost of the pandemic. And you know, as you see with the reduction of the furlough uh, cost or the sharing of the furlough cost, one can expect the government to try and pare back uh, its, its exposures, both under this and the CILB, ILS and other schemes, uh, as soon as they possibly can, given the economic impact it will have. Okay, thank you. And then I'd probably pass over to Gabrielle for, for her, uh, her thoughts on the USPP side, if that's all right. Sure, thank you, Kristen. Along the same theme as in bank waivers, where companies are looking at bank waiver needs, it is more than likely that they are also facing the same situation in their U.S. private placement financing. The initial COVID period has seen a flurry of amendment activities, followed by a pause of a few weeks. Recently, requests have picked up again as Treasury teams come to grips with upcoming half-year financials, which give more clarity on whether they need waivers from their U.S. private placements. From the processes we are currently supporting our clients on, we are seeing some repetitive themes that I'd like to share with you. Investors are placing extreme scrutiny on thorough review of bank facilities in order to assess whether most favored lender provisions should be introduced into note purchase agreements where they did not benefit from them previously to ensure that they are treated no worse off than banks as part of the waiver process. So that's along the lines of the pari to sue discussion that we just had. Waivers are preconditioned on investors approving the amendments and waivers sought in the bank process. So as you can see, the two processes are very much interlinked. Another common ask, just as in bank waivers, is enhanced financial reporting as well as adding periodic conference call updates from senior management. The success of achieving suspension of financial covenants or covenant amendments depend on whether investors see the request as absolutely necessary, which is often need to be backed up by appropriate modeling by the company, rather than good to have scenarios. So one period financial covenant relief is easier to accomplish, and we've recently done one in a matter of days. Whereas if you're looking for two to three period covenant relief, those tend to be seen as structural changes in terms of credit evaluation and often will be counted with additional requirements such as monthly or quarterly minimum liquidity compliance. There are also demands to build in coupon step up on covenant deterioration or rating decline. So structural ads will inevitably take much longer to achieve and it could be a matter of four to six weeks. In terms of costs that companies are looking at it for amendments, Companies can expect payment of amendment fees across board to all note holders and not just to the votes that are required to pass the consents. And we're seeing currently between 5 to 20 basis points. Margin increases are common as well. Treasury teams should also be aware that if agents are engaged to facilitate, facilitate the process, agents are currently charging fees that are not that different from what they are charging in terms of new issuance fees. Another area to pay attention is the subsidiary debt basket. The ability to seek bilateral or local facilities on a subsidiary level is an area for corporates to access quick liquidity. Guarantor subsidiaries are typically not restricted under USPPs to, in to incur unsecured debt, but non-guarantor subsidiaries typically are subject to such restrictions. 
So attention needs to be paid to the subsidiary debt basket to check whether there is room to incur the bilateral facilities. There, this is not an area where there is much sympathy from note holders for additional flexibility. Um, in a new issuance we're currently working on, the subsidiary, the subsidiary debt basket is something that investors are standing very, very firm on. In terms of new activities in the capital markets, the investment grade debt capital markets remain open and have been very active, with a number of corporates taking advantage of the current availability of long-term cheaper fixed rate funding. These corporates tend to be in sectors that are relatively insulated from the effects of COVID, for example, utilities and defense. The U.S. private placement market has started to see signs of new life after a complete shutdown in February, and is open for investment grade corporates. But these transactions are in the jumbo deal size category where investors see comfort in large scale participation as validation of the credit. The PP marketing period is typically longer than bank financing, so it is certainly not a quick solution to immediate cash needs. And consideration needs to be given to financial ratio levels and other baskets such as dividends and subsidiary indebtedness that will bind the company for 10 plus years. Um, sharing some observations right from the trenches right now, um, we are working on a large transaction which is in the middle of being priced. And we are seeing some serious market players drop out, not because of documentation requests or the credit of the particular issuer, but purely because of uncertainty of COVID and fear of a second spike. There were several, several investors that cited second spike as the reason for not participating. The book is also looking much thinner than expected. Covenants and other key monetary terms are less issuer friendly. Pricing is potentially 1% higher than could otherwise be achieved in non-COVID times. Due to the equity and debt market swings, initial price indications provided by bankers in the pre-mandate period may not ultimately be a deliverable at the time of pricing. Given that U.S. PPs have long maturities as well as make whole premiums for prepayment, pricing is definitely something to consider due to the long-term nature of this instrument and the punitive exit of make whole. If companies are looking for sterling and euros rather than U.S. dollars, they should also take into account swapped costs we are not seeing much natural euros bids at the moment. Swap indemnities are currently expected not to just cover the period from pricing to closing, but also for the ongoing period of the tenor of the notes. There was a lot more flexibility prior to COVID in this area of who takes the burden of currency moves during the life of the notes, but not in this current environment. In particular, if companies had an ongoing strategy of asset sales to reduce leverage and offers of prepayment are required to be made to U.S. PP holders as a result of asset sales, the impact of currency swings is definitely something to take into account as an additional cost on swap indemnity down the road. Back to you. Well, thanks very much, then, Gabrielle. That's, um... I must confess, certainly when I speak to many treasurers, there have been a lot of folks who have used the USPP market to uh, raise or to bolster some of their uh, liquidity um, channels. So uh, that's been really helpful. I'm sure we'll get a few more questions later on on that. Um, should we move, uh, Kristen, on to um, the next slide? Preserving cash? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please, Suresh. Um, and I suppose people have heard enough from me, so I'll just make a few quick points and I'll hand over to Rachel because uh, that, that's by far the potential the biggest uh, cash saving for treasurers. So in terms of preserving cash, of course, it's been an intense focus uh, for treasury teams um, throughout the pandemic, uh, and that's taken many forms. Uh, as I mentioned, Rachel will talk about the deferral of defined uh, pension benefits, deficit repair payments, uh, and there are certainly others as well. Um, so the deferral of real estate rents and so forth. And I think there are a couple of points to play, just to bear in mind when we're talking about deferrals of payments. One is to ensure that the way that that is approached does not inadvertently trip uh, financial distress events and default, uh, um, and that, that can be done through 
almost saying to creditors that you're bust, you can't do it unless they do this or that. And treasurers really need to avoid making statements like that. And so the positioning of those conversations is key. Uh, and secondly, with the best will in the world, pushing out payment terms for creditors can have a number of unintended consequences. So, for example, you might turn an ordinary trade credit into financial indebtedness because of the duration of the deferral. Uh, and that can impact on financial indebtedness undertakings, but also financial covenants more generally. The other point I wanted to make is really around pushing uh, benefits in working capital were around receivables financing arrangements uh, and whether they are recourse and non-recourse. I touched earlier on the fact that they need to be on robust terms so that they don't potentially cost default domain financings. But non-recourse receivables sales are clearly very much in vogue. Uh, but there's a very big difference between achieving accounting derecognition uh, under IFRS or equivalent GAP, uh, which would be the accounting term for non-recourse, and what is non-recourse for the purposes of your debt documents, which is often a far higher bar. Uh, and we see waivers and amendments de de dealing with that specific issue. And so before you embark on uh, what can be quite an administrative process of putting these receivables lines in place, it's just worthwhile checking that you can actually implement them in, in accordance with the terms of your existing financings. The last point, just to touch on there, um, was testing track cash. We're seeing a lot of that, um, particularly with geographically diverse businesses. Uh, and so Treasury is really reaching out into other markets uh, and testing the need for uh, cash reserves in local businesses and just trying to, to funnel them through existing cash management, cash cooling solutions to try and uh, justify or try, try, try and maximise the, the benefit of those arrangements and, and to be uh, as lean as possible. Um, but, but on that, I'd, I'd like to hand over to Rachel on uh, potentially the way of, uh, of actually improving working capital significantly through deferring uh, pension scheme payments. Thanks, Christian. So we've seen companies with defined benefit pension schemes looking at reducing or deferring their deficit repair contributions to their schemes. And a number of companies have actually already managed to agree those deferrals with their trustees. The pensions regulator thinks that it's around 10% uh, of companies that have already managed to, to get agreements over the line. I think it's been helpful for those companies that the regulator issued guidance a few months ago, which recognised that it might be appropriate for trustees to agree to defer deficit contributions to help the employer with cash flow issues and to support the employer's business during this time. The regulator did suggest that at first, trustees should only agree to a very limited deferral of up to, say, three months. That was really so that trustees could give themselves some time to gather information from the company so that they could try to, to really understand the potential longer term impact of COVID-19 on the business and the company's reasons for, for requesting a deferral. Now, having said that, we have actually seen trustees agreeing to defer deficit reduction contributions for up to as much as 12 months and, and the regulator doesn't seem to have objected to that. Obviously, each company situation and each scheme situation is different. And so the length of any deferral will really depend on the particular circumstances of the scheme and its sponsoring employer. Now, the regulator actually published updated guidance just yesterday, which recognised that discussions with lenders and other creditors are likely to have, of course, progressed over the last couple of months. And so... The regulator's view is that employers should now be more able to provide trustees with financial projections as part of the, the employer's updated business plan. And that would assist trustees in, in assessing any proposals to defer or reduce contributions to the pension scheme. So the regulator now expects trustees to be undertaking detailed due diligence on the employer's financial position before agreeing to suspend contributions or to before agreeing to extend a suspension that they've already previously agreed for potentially a three-month period. The regulator said yesterday that trustees need to consider whether there's a genuine and, and possibly temporary uncertainty over the employer's position or actually a material deterioration. And if there's good evidence that the employer's position has materially worsened and isn't expected to recover in a, in a reasonably short time frame, then the regulator expects trustees to consider actually renegotiating the scheme's overall funding arrangement as opposed to, to agreeing to a suspension of contributions. So it's worth bearing in mind that distinction. 
just turning to to what the company should expect if if it approaches its schemes trustees to request a deferral of contributions. Firstly, trustees will request information from the company so that they can understand the immediate and also the potential longer term impact of COVID-19 on the business and also then the rationale behind the request to defer contributions. Secondly, trustees are likely to seek assurances that banks are supporting the business and that the company won't be paying, importantly, dividends during the proposed deferral period. And just to note there that the regulator does expect trustees to seek a legally binding commitment to that effect around no dividend payments. And then thirdly, trustees are likely to seek assurances that the company will only make intergroup loans and, and transfers of value if those are really essential for the survival of the business. And there, again, um, the regulator is likely to expect trustees to seek legally binding commitments to that effect. Now, before a company approaches its trustees to discuss a deferral or a reduction of contributions, there are a few things that it's, called, it's important to look at to just make sure that there aren't going to be any unintended consequences of doing that. Firstly, it's important that the company checks the terms of their existing banking covenants and other facilities because in some situations, actually just approaching the trustees to try to renegotiate the, the contributions could in itself constitute an event of default under those arrangements. So if that's potentially going to be an issue, then the company will obviously need to decide how they're going to address that before they actually approach the trustees. And then secondly, companies will need to make sure that they've looked carefully at their scheme rules to check that deferring contributions wouldn't actually trigger the winding up of the scheme, which would, um, which would crystallise a, a statutory debt that would be immediately payable. So if the company has previously granted security to the scheme, it will also um, be important to check that deferring contributions wouldn't crystallise that security. So I think the, the overall message is that trustees, from what we can see, they're likely to be fairly receptive to engaging with the employer on, on a request to defer contributions, but the employer will need to be prepared to provide detailed information on, on the projections for the company and probably also a legally binding commitment to make sure that the scheme's position is adequately protected. Thanks, Naresh. No, thank you. It's, um, and this is really, I guess, focusing on uh, defined benefit schemes. That's right. Yes. Okay. I mean, there are there are um, there are options for for defined contribution schemes as well, but um, the the cash flow impact is is usually likely to be um, not as great as, as as what you could achieve with a DB deferral of contribution. Okay. Thank you. So I guess we're um, heading to Kevin. Hi, yes, yes, yes. I was a slightly distracted by the thunder and lightning outside my house, which is pretty apt when an insolvency lawyer stands up to talk to treasurers of the company, I would have thought. Anyway, <laughs> what, am I, what am I here to talk about when everyone else is talking about repairing of the, of the balance sheet? Because insolvency lawyers uh, are generally not regarded as the people who... Uh, who come along and repair the balance sheet un unless we can get a restructuring away for you. So I'm here because the government's published the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill uh, a week or two ago and is intent on pushing it through Parliament probably by the beginning of July. And that bill uh, contains provisions which are radically going to alter the way insolvency and restructuring law in this co country work. Uh, and they're going to impact, frankly, behaviours of suppliers, tenants, customers, any, anyone who, who owes you money because of the things that government is planning to change, some of them on a temporary basis, some of them on a permanent basis. So, so, so what, are they, what is the government trying to do? Well, the first thing the government has, has recognised is that when furlough schemes and, and all the rest of it begin to, to ease off and the government stops uh, supporting everything, there's likely to be a liquidity problem, uh, particularly amongst SME companies, uh, which, which may uh, 
potentially go all the way through through the chain up to the biggest PLCs, depending on how bad it gets. And therefore, the, the government wants to, to control how demands for payment are made and, and try and persuade companies to act sensibly and reasonably when chasing creditors and, and, and the like. So the first thing they've done in the insolvency bill is, in essence, limit the right to issue a winding up petition in circumstances where uh, that petition couldn't have been issued, but uh, 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 but for the impact that, that COVID has had on the company. So if you want to issue a winding up petition or a statutory demand, you're essentially going to have to, to prove that COVID had no impact and you would, have, you would have issued that statutory demand or winding up petition mm. anyway. The, the, the consequence of that, in a sense, is it's taking away a fundamental right of a creditor to, to chase a debtor for payment, which is actually... You. Uh, and often the best way to, to get paid when you when you have someone refusing to pay you, frankly, is to threaten to issue a winding up petition. Uh, but you're about to lose that right, at least for a, for a period of a, a month after the bill becomes effective. So at least until August this year, I would say. But I imagine the government will extend that period if it looks like liquidity issues are going, going to, to continue. But in addition to that, not only have they stopped you issuing winding up petitions, they've also created a moratorium, which companies can use now. So now, uh, a moratorium, uh, in a sense, is a, is a good idea uh, because it allows breathing space. What this moratorium is trying to do, in a sense, is mimic the Chapter 11 process, which uh, exists in America, whereby directors stay in control of a company which is in distress with the aim of enabling a restructuring to occur in a timely manner. Uh, now, the, the process in England is very different to the process in America. The process in America is, is intensely court-driven. Uh, the process here is going to be governed by a monitor, but the big point of the moratorium is going to be that any debts incurred pre-moratorium other than to certain types of lenders uh, and certain types of financial services providers, by and large, are not going to be capable of collection, by and large, by you. So, so you won't be able to, to issue a winding up petition and you won't be able to pursue for, for payment of, of bills that are outstanding. But in a sense, it gets worse than that, because what we're also going to do is introduce the, what, what, what's known as ipso facto rules, ipso facto uh, it's frankly a fancy Latin word for after the fact. But what it, what, it, what it means is that if a company goes into a moratorium in order to do a, or try to do a restructuring, you won't be able to terminate supply contracts. You won't be able to kick tenants out. You won't be able to uh, exercise any right under an existing contract that would otherwise have enabled you to terminate for non-payment or, or indeed any other reason. Uh, in addition you will have to keep supplying under the terms of that contract in the same way that you had before uh, ipso facto arose or before the moratorium occurred. So on the one hand, you won't be paid uh, for past liabilities. On the other hand, you will have to keep supplying. Now, on the, on the good side, you will be paid for the supply that you are uh, making during the moratorium period. But of course, many, many companies are reliant on payment in order to uh, enable future supply. Uh, and so th there is a significant risk that provisions such as this, which are being brought in on short notice without any real consultation, may actually have the uh, converse effect that the government wants in the, in the sense that it actually makes payment through the supply chain much, much more difficult. So why are they doing all of this? Well, they're, they're doing it in order to give breathing space for a new restructuring plan which they've created, which, which in a sense is a very good idea again. The restructuring plan is going to look a lot like a scheme of arrangement, except the voting uh, regime will be easier. We'll simply require 75% of creditors to, to, to vote upon it, much like a CBA, but it also has the benefit of having what's known as cross-class cram-down, which has been sort of almost directly lifted from the Chapter 11 process but without some of the, the protections that the chapter 11 process has in it and what the cross-class cram down means is that if you determine that you can split your creditors into to different classes um, so for example let's say you have 
landlords with properties that you, you don't want to pay for and landlords with properties that you do want to pay for. Conceptually, at least, you could put those landlords that you don't want to pay into a separate class and they, they would inevitably vote against the restructuring plan, but their vote won't matter, uh, frankly, provided the other class votes in favour of it and provided they are given at least what they would have got on an insolvency. Now, why do things like that matter? Things like that matter because at the moment the restructuring processes which exist require companies to take account of the fact that some people may vote for things and some things may, people may vote against things. And as a result, the, plan, the, the restructuring plans that are put forward at the moment are, are more balanced to enable everyone to get some benefit out of it. Cross-class cram-down, I suspect, ultimately will change behaviour as, um, as to who gets what out of a restructuring. It's also um, fair to say that, that the moratorium provisions are, are going to create problems for the restructuring plan because the moratorium provisions have some, un, some what hopes are in, unintended consequences attached to them. The biggest one being that if, if the moratorium occurs and uh, a restructuring fails such that the moratorium comes to an end, any company that goes into an insolvency process within 12 weeks of that moratorium ending, the, the, the ordinary order of uh, priority of payments is changed. So, so if, if you go bust within 12 weeks of the end of the moratorium, what essentially happens under the bill is that anyone with a lending or financial services relationship with the insolvent company suddenly jumps ahead of the queue, jumps ahead of float and charge creditors, jumps ahead of the, the expenses of an administrator or liquidator, and essentially ranks just below a fixed charge. And that's whether they had security or they didn't. Uh, and, and indeed, the, there's an anomaly that banks who actually have a float and charge would be better ignoring their float and charge and actually taking this, this sort of perverse ranking that's been created. Now, that's going to create huge problems because take the pension talk you just had. Pension funds can't be lenders uh, in the same way that, that a, a bank or, uh, or an intercompany debt could be, for example. Uh, and therefore, pension creditors are potentially going to be subordinated to banks uh, under this moratorium process if it, if it fails, which, is, which clearly can't be what banks want, because banks don't want the, the bad PR of, of of, of them benefiting when pensioners don't. But that, that's currently the way the government has drafted it. And now we and various others are trying to get changes put into the bill through the committee stage in the House of Lords. But, you know, frankly, who knows whether those changes will be made and, and two or three weeks' time we will see what we end up with. Now, the thing about all of these um, changes is they are themselves bound to, to, to change behaviours. If, if you know that, for example, that if you have, have a lending relationship, you will rank ahead of a floating charge, even if you didn't have a floating charge, if a, if a moratorium fails, then you're going to look at your own terms and conditions and try and work out, well, if, if I have a debt which is outstanding more than 30 days, can I get that treated as a loan arrangement within those documents uh, to ensure that I potentially get paid on, on an insolvency ahead of a load of unsecured creditors who, who haven't made that sort of change. Now, um, I know that's happening because we, we've been asked about it and we've been talking about it. Indeed, I, I've talked to our own management about could, could we look at how we would, would m uh, manage our terms and conditions? Could we look at how we could bring about an early termination uh, before it so facto kicked in to prevent us from terminating? Could we look at getting cash on account uh, every supplier in the chain is going to start asking itself the same questions the moment they realise what the consequences of this moratorium linked with ipso facto uh, is going to be. And if, if every supplier in the chain is beginning to ask other creditors to, to give them cash on account or differential termination provisions, etc., that eventually is going to wend its way through the, the supply chain um, even if there are those within it who, who would gladly say no to all of those provisions. That's what I was essentially going to say. There are other changes being made, including a relaxation in sort of wrongful trading rules for, for directors. That, that relaxation, uh, you know, frankly, is, is interesting, but 
it, it's much easier to sue directors for breach of duty than it is for wrongful trading. And so probably doesn't give directors the sort of comfort the government hopes. Um, but, but the bigger concerns, uh, in, in my view, are going to be the sort of changes in behaviour as, as to whether people are going to pay or not pay, terminate or not terminate as a result of the changes being driven through the moratorium and if so, facto type processes. Over to you. Kevin, that, that's, that's really interesting. One, one really quick question. Um, this sounds like a really big thing in this sort of insolvency world. Is this, this is something really Treasury and whoever's listening on this should really, you know, wake up and really read the detail because it's such a big change? This is the most fundamental change in insolvency law in the United Kingdom in 30-odd years. It was... Um, Bits of it were consulted on three or four years ago. The bits that were consulted on were widely criticised by by the sort of bodies, legal bodies, accounting bodies who um, who uh, tend to respond to government on these things. Um, you know, philo philosophically, the changes that, that 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 they want to make in terms of creating a moratorium and giving breathing space and that sort of thing are conceptually good changes, particularly when you're looking at what might come in three months' time as, as lockdown eases and furlough goes away and, and all of the rest of it in relation to the UK economy. But equally, it, it, it's a fundamental right of creditors and of commerce that if you enter into an arrangement, you are entitled to be paid. And and if if, if you are putting in place more and more blockages to that payment short of insolvency. Everyone accepts that if a company goes bust, there is never enough to pay anyone. But what this is doing is actually changing behaviours pre-insolvency. And I think some of what they've got in there, I, I can't believe that the, the drafts people meant to, to have it work the way that, that it is working. They didn't go out for consultation to, to any extent on many of these provision. So they didn't have the benefit of people looking at it and, and critiquing it to, to change it before it went out. As I say, we've now got various people talking to, to the Lords and Lords committees to try and get sensible changes made to it. I mean, so, so as I say, philosophically, it's not necessarily a bad idea, but, it, but it's got to be done without the sort of errors that are are in here as a result of rushing out a piece of legislation that, frankly, I would say isn't truly fit for purpose at the moment. Okay, that's brilliant. I'm sort of conscious we're, um, we're sort of into overtime now, but we have got some really interesting questions. So I'm going to take my um, authority as a moderator just to um, answer some of these questions. So I've got a couple of questions, Gabrielle, for you around the private place for market. Mm -hmm. um, one is, um, is any new private placement funding becoming available for sub-investment grade companies? And a sort of allied quote, well, another question on PP is, given what you've said around investor interest in the PP market, would you say that potential issuers should issue, should issue now, wait till, you know, post-summer, wait till the end of the year? Where would your sense be around timing? In terms of the first question, I certainly do not see the USPT market being open for uh, fallen angels at this moment. The credits that we're looking at, I think, are being punished by at least one notch down from where they, they normally are because of the uncertainty of uh, what's going to happen to the balance sheet over the next few months. And investors are, are taking their own analysis uh, discounting on on the uncertainties of of um, certainly the the possibility of a second spike. Right. Okay. And then I've got a question. So thank you for that. I've got a question um, around the CCFF, and it's um, are there any restrictions or conditions relating to existing RCFs or bilaterals, which be which would be impacted? if I applied for the CCFF program? Yes, yeah, so it's Christian, I'm happy to say that one. So the, <clears throat> there, there ought to, to be uh, specific prohibitions or consequences uh, as long as you have sufficient capacity 
under any financial indebtedness restriction to actually incur the debt. Uh, and obviously incurring that debt uh, will feed into your leverage covenant. Uh, and uh, so, so that would need to be taken into account. But, but those would be the two most obvious uh, areas of that. Um, if you are in the investment grade space or crossover space, your restriction might be on incurring debt outside of the, the usual debt raising entity. So if you were proposing that there, that would be relevant. Uh, and the CCFS itself requires a guarantee from the holding company if, um, if, if, if the holding company is itself not the issuer. So that might need to be worked through a particular company's financing arrangements to see if that was problematic. But, but by and large, no. Okay, but I guess like all these things, it just delays and slows down the overall process. Yes, that's right. And, you know, with some clients, we've had a very iterative process with the Bank of England in terms of, you know, with the with the block on dividends, for example, if that's put in place by a finance company, uh, you know, can that finance company upstream the money by way of dividends to push it around the group where it's needed? Uh, certainly with CLB, ILS the British Business Bank has confirmed that, that that is fine, but that same uh, clarification I don't think has yet been uh, given by, by the Bank of England, although it would be logical to do so. Okay, and then I've got um, another specific question around um, restrictions on things like dividends you've talked about, and um, do they only apply if we issue over £50 million, pounds, for instance? Is there a sort of de minimis level where some of these conditions apply, or is it just if you take the money, the applied will stop. You no, know, so uh, I told you I wasn't very clear at the start, but with the CCFS, uh, the dividend restrictions and the pay restrictions and so forth only kick in if the maturity of the CP issuance is after, I think, it's the 19th of May next year, whereas for the CLB ILS, the restriction kick, kicks in if you borrow more than £50 million. So it's a timing one for CCFS, uh, and the CLB one is, is, a, is a quantum trigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, I've got one last question, um, whether it's for you, Kristen, or for, for you, Gabrielle, around, you know, you, you've talked about debt issuing, it's people issuing debt and a lot of it maturing early 2021. Um, do you think we're going to have an issue? Do you think treasurers need to think about that? in terms of when they look for when they refinance some of their existing borrowings? Uh, because if they're all, you know, if the whole market is all refinancing at one go in one particular time frame, it's going to be particularly difficult. I think there is there's definitely uh, that is something to, to consider. For example, in this current environment, I think for the next month or two, unless there is some very urgent need to access the USPP market, you really do have to consider that the covenant levels that you're looking at as well as the pricing are going to be staying with you, you know, for the next 8 to 12, 15 years. I think the 15 years seem to be pricing better. Um, so so it, it is a, a long commitment. Um, so from the USPP perspective, I would think it is definitely better to, to wait at least for the next over the summer period, um, perhaps not until, you know, next year when you really need the money. Because as, as we've discussed before, it is a long process. Right. Yeah. And I think on the bank side, it's, it's very similar. So I don't want to sound too salesy, but certainly getting in uh, well ahead of the, the need for that financing will be key, I think. And that's driven by not only lender credit processes uh, and the requirements for additional information to refinance debt, but, but also, you know, the audit firms are obviously concerned around going capital statements and the need for 18 months of, of committed, committed funding. And so that is also a driver in the current market uh, where people are trying to get, for example, MAE and financial covenant waivers just to facilitate the sign-off on their accounts. And, and so there'll be a balance of factors at play, but certainly not leaving it too late and ensuring that you know, at least the auditors are on board with the approach that you're taking so that you don't end up with awkward discussions around going concern qualifications, although for many that that is, you know, the reality of life. Okay, and um, I'm going to go to one last question for Kevin. Um, under current drafting, Kevin, how long do the provisions 
in this insolvency governance bill last post moratorium, please? That's quite a specific question. So those provisions which uh, are expressed to be temporary by and large last for a month after the uh, bill is brought into effect, um, but the government has uh, reserved to itself sort of Henry VIII-style powers that, that were talked about around the sort of Brexit document. So those are within this, this bill so that they can modify time limits and provisions and may well, I suspect, you know, revisit some of the some of the t provisions of the, the bill once it's en enacted if they are actually causing problems that, that the government didn't anticipate when it when it issued the thing. So but by and large, at the moment, it's a month. But my working assumption is that, that those uh, dates may well get extended if um, if if the market goes into sort of free fall. OK. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so we've, we've definitely reached beyond the end of our time, and I, I hope you found this webinar today helpful. It's definitely opened up my eyes to a lot more reading that I need to do. As a reminder, um, we have the uh, Festival of Treasury Transformation, 13th to 16th of July, free to attend, open to non-members, and we're delighted to confirm the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Most Reverend Justin Welby, will be providing uh, one of the key speeches. Also a reminder of our next webinar, which will cover eyeball transition on July 1. And um, thank you all very much for the questions. Um, those we didn't manage to get through to, we will tr do a write up of this session and we'll try and incorporate some of the answers to it in that. Please take time to fill in the survey. Feedback you provide is always really helpful when we do future events. Um, as you know from experience, this event's being recorded. And you should get an email in the next few days confirming it's available. And um, finally, I'd like to thank Gabrielle, Kristen, Rachel and Kevin for sharing their insights and to HSF for sponsoring this event. Uh, thank you and um, stay safe and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Thanks Naresh. Thank you.